you can go ahead and turn to, and we started Judges 13, 13th chapter 25. The 13th chapter there, we'll go from uh, 2 through 5. Just kind of give out a, here a, a base or a foundation, so to speak. Uh, tonight I'm going to talk about lifetime consecration. Um, uh, last time I was in Fort, we talked about tradition and we talked about all of that. And really where we're getting ready to go is from what the Lord is telling me is that we're turning the tables to look inwardly for a season to make sure that we're measuring up uh, to the word of God in a majority, in every, not majority, but in every area of our life that we're picking up what we see slack or we don't find we're focusing on enough. Um, lately, I've been measuring my life in the area or in the sense of consecration from the time that I first got saved all the way up until now. And if any of us that have been saved for a long time, uh, we can say that there has been a great difference. Although we have a lot more knowledge, we have a lot more wisdom, uh, there is kind of a, uh, a distance between our passion for when we first got saved all the way up until now. And if you're not, praise God. But I know some of us are kind of dealing with that. From, you know, when we first got saved, nobody had to tell us to pray, nobody had to tell us to fast, nobody had to tell us to do anything. We did it on our own because we had a heart to seek after the Lord. We had a heart to know Him. We wanted to, to, to cling on to everything that the Word said. We were, we were ready. We were zealous. We had a lot of zeal, but as time goes on, uh, we, we become a little bit too comfortable in where we are. We don't really like to be moved. Not everybody, but I know I have that problem sometimes. And so looking at these areas, at, at these areas of my life that I need to focus more on, that I may be prosperous, not only in my natural life, but in my spiritual life. Consecration is for both natural and spiritual. Uh, over the ages, even in uh, time spent, that I've spent in the church, the word consecration has always been used to describe events or, practic or practices of our great church. When we think about communion or foot washing, we think about consecration or sanctification. We think about setting uh, time aside for the Lord. When we get ready to do our solemn assembly, which we've done uh, about maybe a month ago, we have set an entire week uh, for the Lord. It's just solely for Him. Everything that we do is about Jesus. What we read, what we watch, what we listen to is all geared toward Jesus Christ. And that's good. Uh, when we think about marriages, we think about consecration, something that's been sanctified by God, that's set apart for His use, uh, for His glory. Um, it, we, we look at that and we say, oh, that's consecration, and we're sanctifying that. And that word is used to describe a specific use or to ordain for something that has a particular reason. It can also mean uh, for something that is going to be made holy or sacred. Consecration or being consecrated should not be a moment, but it should be a lifestyle. Amen. Consecration is not something that we do once a year. It's not something that we do once a month. It's not something that we do uh, every three years. You know, I used to go to church where they call a holy convocation. They would call the saints to gather for a whole month, and they just have church service. So consecration is more than that than just getting together, uh, than just having a week of fasting and a week of praying. Consecration is in your entire life. Your life must be consecrated for the use of Jesus Christ. Um, when we deny and devalue the attitude and the characteristic of consecration, we begin to lose the purpose, our purpose, and power. Uh, once again, the definition of consecration is to make or to declare something holy, to dedicate one's life or time to a specific purpose, or to be ordained. We as a people of God, we are called to be a consecrated people. So to be used by him for his purpose. In this teaching, I pray that I would bring about a resurrection of our attitude, our perception, our belief thinking on what we deem to be consecration. In this hour, we cannot undermine nor shortcut the real consecration process. We cannot limit it only to being about a presentation, but it also needs to be an inward, an inward change that is going to be brought forth in our presentation. We cannot devalue the worth 
of Jesus Christ inside of us. And that's what we do when we take away consecration. We devalue who Jesus is in our lives. So when we determine that we need to stay in a life stance and a life posture of consecration, we will not be easily lulled to sleep. We will not feel as if we have achieved perfection in our own thinking because of who has taught us or how long we've been in church. Uh, we will begin to understand that we have to continue to seek. We've got to continue to pray. This is not a process that after you get baptized in Jesus' name, you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you stop. Consecration endures into eternity. So I want to get to Judges 13, 2 through 5. And I'm going to read it. It says, And there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink. And eat not any unclean thing, for lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So if anybody that know who we can really talk about, we can really talk about Samson. And uh, many of us that have read the story, we know Samson is this great warrior uh, for Israel. He fights. I mean, he can slay any type of person, any army. It, it really doesn't matter. He has been anointed to do that. But what we find is, is that in the conception of Samson being born, he is already birthed in the consecration. Uh -huh. That's all he knows. From the time of his conception, the Bible says that his mother was given the commandment that even she had to take a vow because she was carrying something that was consecrated for the Lord. We know that Samson's sole purpose was to be the fighter for Israel against the Philistine army. That was his whole anointing. That's what he was empowered to do. But he had to be, what, consecrated in order to do that. Uh -huh. I want to go to number six and one. I'm sorry, wait a minute. Judge, uh, Judges 14, I'm going to read there, and then I'm going to go and explain. Uh, and it says, 14, or starting at the fifth verse, it says, Then went Samson down, and his father, his mother to uh, Timonath, and came to the vineyards of Timonath, and beheld a young lion roared against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. And he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. And after a time, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. This is very significant. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating. And he came to his father and his mother, and he gave them, and they did eat. But he told them, he, he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. We talk about why that's so significant. So I want you to turn to number six. Uh, we're just going to go from one, and uh, I'm not sure where I'm going to stop just yet. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and start reading. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow, of a Nazarite to separate themselves unto the Lord. He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husks. All the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled. In which he separate himself unto the Lord, he shall be holy. And shall let the locks of his hair and his head grow. All the days that he separate himself unto the Lord, he shall come 
and no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister. When they die because the consecration of his God is upon his hand. And all the days of his separation, he is holy unto the Lord. And if any man die, there is suddenly by him, he hath defiled the head of his consecration. So here Numbers is telling us and giving us the characteristics and the description of what it is to become a Nazarite. You can be a male and you can be a female. Uh, but there is a list of things that you can and cannot do as a Nazarite. And we understand that from his time, Samson's time of conception, he was taught this. He was taught that he shouldn't go to the vineyard to take up the grapes and to drink strong drinking. He wasn't supposed to cut his hair. He knew all of this stuff. Now in Judges 14, 5 to 5, I'm reading a lot, um, it talks about that when he went to go get this woman, he passed by the lion's carcass. Now what did the scripture just say in Numbers? It says that he can't touch a dead thing. It's unclean. He can't eat a dead. He picks up the honey out of the lion and then he takes it. Once again, he violates another thing because he said, don't even do it for your mom, your dad, your sister, you don't do it for nobody. And what does the Bible say? He gives it to his who? His mother and his father. But what did he leave out? He didn't tell them where it came from. You cannot shortcut the process of your consecration. You cannot do that. You must be very careful of neglecting consecrated lifestyles. The neglect, as we see, causes Samson to become entangled in the snare of the enemy. Your consecration, listen to me, is directly attached to the anointing and the call that you carry. Remember when Jesus went to the wilderness, I believe it's in Luke chapter 4, I'm not going to turn to it, but Jesus goes into the wilderness and he's in a place of consecration. Now we know he's God and all of that, but he goes into a place of consecration. And the reason why I'm saying this is we're going to see the same thing happen with Samson. His consecration is attached to the anointing on his life. When he comes out and Jesus steps into the synagogue, he says, I've been what? Anointed to preach. I've been anointed to do this. I've been anointed to do that. His consecration is directly related to the anointing on his life. When you look at Samson, Samson comes across this woman by the name of Delilah. And Delilah is sent by the Philistines. They have uh, coerced her to be able to work with them in order to kill Samson. They wanted to find where his strength lies. And I have a message of preparation talking about you need to be careful who you give your heart to in this hour. Because it's very detrimental. Because they will come with spirits of manipulation. They'll come with spirits of, of distraction. And they will take you right out of the place where God has called you to be where you should be reigning and you should have, have dominion over, they will take you right out of that place. Amen. When you step outside of consecration. So we see Samson. Now he's already violated, but God has given him some grace. He still has the power. Do you remember the, the message that Pastor spoke about, about being shaken and not stirred, and he said that at that last point, when Delilah comes that last time, he says, I'm just going to shake myself, and I'm going to be able to do what I normally am able to do. But that didn't happen that time. When you start to step outside of the lifestyle or the lifetime of consecration, you will begin to expose your weakness. You expose it. Now, this is how I know that Samson was taught from a young age who he was and who he was supposed to be. It's because when Delilah asked him the third time, she asked him, where does your strength lie? And he said, well, she says, if you really love me, you're going you, you to tell me where it is. And so he finally says, it's in my hair. If you cut my hair off, I ain't got no power. And so what does the word tell us about it? The word says, be not entangled, but again. 
that he's already received grace. He hasn't lost the anointing. He has not gone back to renew his vows as the scripture has said that he should do. He's not done that, but he still maintained the power. But when you step outside of your life of consecration, you open yourself up to being exposed to the enemy's tactics. And so now, Samson has exposed his weakness to somebody who he shouldn't have given his heart to in the first place. Right. Be careful. Right. Your consecration is the means of your life. It keeps you. It'll hold you. Yeah. So Samson, his hair gets cut off and he tries to shake himself again. He tries to act in the power of God, but... He notices that the Spirit of God is not with him now. He, he, he can't do what he is normally able to do. He's powerless. When you step outside of your life of consecration, you'll be powerless. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you don't have that attachment to the power. You're only a conduit for what God does through you. Mm -hmm. It don't come from you. That's right. It comes from the Spirit. And so when you move yourself, if you take a if you take a plug and you plug it out of the socket, it's not going to bear what electricity. Right. Why? Because you have cut off the power source that gives that thing power. If I try to take that lamp outside and I plug it from the wall and try to turn it on and get mad because I, I know it's unplugged and I don't plug it in, whose fault is that? That's my fault. I know how the system works. But if I don't do the necessary things in order for me to get the light on, then there's no purpose in the lamp. And so now, when he steps outside of consecration, what that tells me is, is he lost sight of his purpose. He's supposed to be a fight on Israel. He's left Israel defenseless because he's lost sight of his purpose because somebody else has came in and got his heart and his attention. Be careful was entertaining your heart and your spirit in this hour. Because it means to take you away from your purpose. And when you take away your purpose and you take away your power, what do you have left? So now we find Samson got his eyes plucked out. They got him, you know, in prison. And they bring him out. And, and this is the, one of the things that I love about Jesus is that there should have been, especially in that time, he shouldn't have got no power back. That was not an area of grace. The law did not have room for grace. If you did something wrong, you better hope to God you didn't do something too bad that you would have died for. You better hope that you could bring a sacrifice. The Samson is left there. He can't see. He ain't got no power, but all of a sudden the hair on his head begins to come back and he says, God, if you just give me one more chance, one, one, just one more chance, let me get one more chance, please. I'll show you what I can do. And the Bible says that Samson kills what? More than he's ever killed in his entire existence. He dies in the process. Sorry. But he ends up doing something that he's never done before. Today's message is to get us back to the area and to the place of consecration that we have left, if we've left it at all. And if we haven't left it, to go deeper. Amen. So your consecration wants to get us directly attached to the anointing and the call that you carry. The lack of Samson's consciousness acknowledgement of his consecrated life caused him once again to reveal his area of weakness. You need to keep your area of weakness to yourself. I wouldn't even tell your friends. Because you don't know who's actually plotting against you wanting to see you fall. You need to be careful who you expose your weaknesses to. It is important that when we find that we have stepped outside of our consecration, that we immediately, and I mean immediately, I mean when you find out after you know done whatever you've done, after you said whatever you said, you thought whatever you thought, that you run back to God. Amen. And you immediately go into repentance. Not just God forgive me so I can do it tomorrow. No, God forgive me so I can no. Go back and repent and say, God, help me to turn my mindset away from this thing. Amen. I need you to 
deliver me so that I can be who it is that you call me to be. I really want to be saved. Yeah. Because what I'm finding out in this hour is that people are playing church. Right. And if we're honest, some of us have played church in our, in our sanctified lives. As much as we don't want to admit it. But there's an hour coming that we have to get serious and we have to get dogmatic about our relationship with Jesus Christ. So we gotta go back and we gotta repent. We gotta turn away from it. To stay in places that are outside of consecration will begin to create contrary lifestyles that will render you powerless. You ever did something, said something, thought something once, and then you just ask for forgiveness, but then all of a sudden it starts turning into a cycle? It's because you stepped out of consecration. That's how you know you need to get back into a place of prayer, you need to get back to a place of fasting. When you start recognizing the cycles in your life that keep repeating over and over and over and over again, you gotta put a stop to it. We're gonna go to Romans 8. We are, uh, I'm going to get to that one scripture in a minute about why consecration is so important, especially for our body right now, uh, where God wants to take us. Romans 8, I'm just going to go through that whole chapter, uh, and I'm going to stop probably jumping around for a little bit. And it says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walketh not after the flesh, but after the spirit, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. I want to stop right there. The reason why a lot of us, when we do sin, God forbid, when we do sin, we stay in those cycles is because like the word says, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ. If you're not in a consecrated lifestyle, consecrated posture, and you've allowed yourself to begin to develop habits and cycles in your life that take you away, that pull you away from the presence of God, that release your consecration, and you begin to feel this guilt, and some of that guilt is the Holy Ghost. It comes to convict, it comes to say, I don't know, I don't like that, you can't do that anymore. No That's not right. See, that same spirit that cast out devils should be the same spirit that ought to take you and live right. right. So it says that if you walk right after the flesh, after the spirit, for the law of the spirit of life, in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. I would wish that every time somebody got baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, that somebody would just stand there and tell them, you're free from sin and death. I have the hardest time trying to get to areas of deliverance in my life because nobody ever told me because the churches that I went to, they didn't really preach freedom. They just taught how you should do something based upon the, the organization, whatever. They didn't really teach you how to be free. And we're coming to an hour where we got people coming off the streets and they need to learn how to be free. They don't want to just feel like it. I, I don't want to just feel like I'm free and I come back next week just to find that thing on me. No, I need to find some real deliverance. We have devalued the power and the essence of the Spirit of God that says that I can come in and change your entire life. He said you're free from law and sin and death. That means that you ain't going to have problems with your flesh. Now I'm going to get to that in a minute. But you strive for perfection. We're not perfect people. Can anybody perfect in here? Can you raise our hands if we're perfect? Nobody's perfect, right? The Bible says we all come up. Sure. Everybody. Nobody's bigger than the other person in this room. However long you've been saved, however short you've been saved. Ain't, ain't nobody exempt. Sin is on your life somewhere, somehow. But because of the grace of God, 
God and the blood of Jesus Christ, the baptism in his name and his spirit, you have now been made free from that. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, listen, God sent his own son in likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But what? They that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot what? Please can't please God. Amen. Can't, can't please him. You know what I found out in the church is that we spent so much time trying to get the flesh right that we stopped following after the spirit. Now, now listen to me real quick. We teach. You got to get this, get this in order. That's not what the word said. The Bible said you need to mortify the flesh, kill it. Ain't no need to deal with it. Because the Bible says, what? There is no good thing in the flesh. If we would start teaching more spirit and more about flesh, we would have people moving more towards the spirit. But we make sin and demonic influence so powerful that we make it seem like it's unbeatable. You ever hear people preach about sin? They preach so hard. Oh, you can't get out of here. But no. As a, as a man, as a minister, or whoever you are that is teaching and preaching of the people to show them the way of truth and life, you got to make the spirit more power than the flesh. You got to allow people to understand that if you can get this, if you can understand what the spirit is doing, honey, you can have some deliverance. You can be set free. But the reason why it's not talked about is because a lot of people have not gotten to the place of what we call real deliverance. We have moments where we experience freedom. We have moments where we experience minds being set free and life styles being changed, but when something comes along and it gets in your emotions because you've not dealt with your flesh, to the spirit ought to reign over your mortal body. But then we come into a place where because real deliverance is not really taught in the capacity that it should be, we're really powerless because we step outside of the consecration. We got to get to a place where our spirit outgrow our flesh. When Jesus went to the wilderness, the devil always talked to the flesh. But if you notice, the spirit rose up and answered back to him. He said, why don't you turn these stones into bread? He said, you know the word. The word said that thou shalt not live by bread alone. Who is that? The spirit. He had so much authority that he told the flesh, hey, you know, get down there. When he went to the garden of Gethsemane, I talked about that. Had a problem with his flesh, but his spirit, it outweighed the flesh. Why? Because of the place of consecration. Twelve and fifteen, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. I talked about in Galatians, I believe it's in the fifth chapter, later on down in the verse, it talks about how if you walk in the spirit, 
you must also live in the spirit. And God gave me such a revelation that I never really understand about worship and entwined with consecration. Is that when you begin to not only walk, you begin to live it. It's, it that, that means that's a place. You can go and visit Texas, but that don't mean you live there. So you don't know what really happens there. But if you've lived in Indiana all your life, you can pretty much tell people or South Bend and say, hey, you turn here, you go there. That's what he's talking about. But you're able to maneuver in the spirit of God because you know it. You've been in it so long that it's a part of you. It's not something that's foreign. So when you hear the voice of God, the, the Bible says, the my sheep know my voice. So when you hear him say, go left, you don't have a problem. What do you mean, go left? Who's this? No, when he said go left, he said, oh, because I live in the spirit. I know who that is. I'm going to go left. It's getting to a place where the spirit is outraining our flesh. This is why it's so important when I talked about last week about we have to get into a place where we are in a consistent mode of fasting and praying. you got to develop a lifestyle of fasting and praying. We want to know why we don't see what we want to see in the church today is because we don't have a consecrated life. We just have moments. When I look at some of the scriptures and I look at myself, I look at myself and I say, Alante, you're going to have to come up. I know you're talking, Alante going to have to come up. I'm trying to rediscipline myself in prayer and fasting because I'm looking for God to do a mighty work. So we have to allow the spirit to get so involved in our lives that it's just the way we live. It's just how we walk, it's how we see, it's how we hear. Everything is done by the spirit. So consecrated life, what does that mean? I said I was going to tell two stories. One of my stories is, is that when I was growing up, or uh, when I was starting to develop this relationship with God, it, it was during high school, and I, I didn't have a lot of friends because of one word about that. I, I was trying to get, once again, that zeal. I'm trying to get closer to God. I want to know him. I want to know everything about him. I, I, I got to hear from him. You know, I want to experience everything that the word has to offer to me. And so there was a time of life. I used to play video games all the time. I was a video game. Call of Duty, San Andreas, Grand Theft Auto, all of that stuff. You know, I, I, I used to love that. And uh, in the midst of one of my prayers, in my spirit, I felt something say, give it up. What? He said, give it up. Why? Give it up. And so, I gave it up. The reason why, and a lot of people, get, get, we have different view, viewpoints, and that's okay. The reason why I had to give up playing video games, and it's not because it was wrong for me, it was, you know, it was bad or anything like that, but he told me, he says, because it's keeping you out of your place of prayer. It's keeping you out of your place of prayer. It's distracting you. When I'm calling you to prayer, you're on that video game. I can't have that. I need you to be focused. I need you to be attentive. Amen. And so I gave it up. Now watch this, because God will call some things in your life that you're going to have to do away with that he's not going to call Katie from. Katie might be able to play game. I don't know if she does or not, but she might be able to do that because she doesn't have a problem with God say, pray. She put it down and say, okay, what you want? What you need? I had a problem. It had wrapped me up so tight that I started moving away from my place of consecration. He said, Good luck. And to this day, I still don't play video games. Now, I don't look at other people that, you know, that play video games. Okay, praise the Lord. I, I just can't do that. Yeah. And that's where it's getting ready to come to at a point where we have to stop looking at what everybody else is doing and we start focusing on the life that he gave to you and I. I'm not accountable for what you do. I'm not your pastor. But that's pastor than he is. I'm not. I'm not I, I ate. I ate. But when I go home, I don't have to say, 
same burden that he has. I, I'm not a pastor. I don't carry that office. I don't carry that anointing. He has to go home and he has to worry about your souls. He has to worry about where you are when you're not at church. He has, he has to do that because that's his government. That is what he's been called to do as a pastor. I don't have that call. I got your pastor. I can help you and I can assist you. But once I walk out that door, it's about my life. I have to be concerned and making sure that I don't have to, I don't have, I don't have time to worry about whether somebody else is doing what they should be doing or not. I don't have the time. Because that's not my job. My job is to make sure that I am upholding the consecrated lifestyle that God has given to me and that I'm doing it so that I can fulfill purpose. I had another friend, and uh, he was, a, this was a time where I had, I had left church, um, I got mad at the church, there was a whole lot that was going on, I just, I said, you know, Lord, if this is what it is, I don't want that, so I was out, but I wasn't out of church, it's like out of it with, you know, doing whatever, I was surrounded by spiritual people, and uh, we had a group that would always get together, and we went, we sang at different places and stuff like that, and I had a real good friend that, uh, he came from the missionary church. You know anything about the missionary church? They're not Pentecostal by any means. Uh, they, they don't believe in the spirit. They don't believe in anything like that. Well, his dad went overseas, and his father was a missionary preacher, uh, ordained by the missionary church. And uh, I believe he went overseas and he came back, and he got filled with the Holy Ghost. He got filled with the Holy Ghost. And he came back and he told his son, which was my best friend at the time, he says, Man, he says, you got to get what I just got. You got to get it. And my friend said, his dad told him that while he was in the, in the garage. And he said, he went upstairs to his room. And he said, God, he said, I want the Holy Ghost. And immediately he started to speak in tongues the moment that he asked for it. Now, I did not know him when he got the Holy Ghost. I just knew him afterwards. And we would hang out all the time. It was a big group of us, so we would always hang out after we got singing or we just get up together and pray, have prayer meetings and stuff like that. And every time I would go to his house, his, his TV was always unplugged. It was always unplugged. And I'm like, dude, why is that never plugged in? He had a deep, I mean, he had the finest, what I'm talking about, he had the finest, the finest I mean, he had it all. I'm trying to figure out if you don't use it. This, and he was in the sports and all the other kind of stuff, but he, he didn't, it was never plugged in. So finally one day I asked him, and I tell you, it blew my mind because I never heard anybody say it the way that he said it before, which changed my whole concept about consecration. Because God started dealing with that years ago. And he said to me, he said, Alante, he said, if I turn that TV on, he said, my flesh, and my flesh is going to take me out of here. I said, what do you mean? He said, I, I deal with too much. If I turn that on, I, I ain't gonna make it. And I never heard somebody say that genuinely. We get different viewpoints all the time about, you know, all that. But he was genuine in why he didn't do it. Now, he didn't grow up in a church that preached anything like that. They didn't teach holiness. They didn't teach living sanctified lives. They didn't teach any of that. They just taught love Jesus and he'll love you back. That's what they taught. But because of his place of consecration, the relationship that he developed with Jesus Christ, alone by the Spirit, it was telling him, God, you can't do that. We're waiting for people to come to us and tell us, you can't do that. You can't go here. No. The Spirit will lead you into what? All true. And see, what happens is that, is that when people start telling us, oh, you can't do that, you can't do this, not that we should not. We send the word out, we need to do it. But the reason why we should not do that, outside of that, is because look at the stuff like, you can't have Facebook, you can't have Twitter. But they don't touch Instagram. You can have that. No, because it's all the same thing. If you take one, you got to take it all. Amen. And that's what happens when we begin to preach about certain things that we don't in, 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 in involve every aspect. We can't be one-sided anymore. If we say it, we gotta live it. It can't just be, oh, only, yeah, only for this, you know, only, only for this, but everything else I don't, I don't do. No, 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 no. If you 
you gonna take that out, you gotta take everything else. We're in a time where people, once again, are looking for the real saints to show up and to show up. I hear all the time when we talk about how evil the world is getting and how bad they're doing this and you know, look at all these people coming up to you doing crazy stuff. And, and, and we get so bogged down about what we hear. But there's a scripture that says that hell shall not what prevail against the church. No matter what they do out there. No matter what they believe out there. We're supposed to be the light that what is not hidden. We can't do that for any consequences. We gotta move up. And y'all gonna hear me say, y'all probably gonna get tired of me saying this when I get up here, is that we gotta come up. We gotta keep pushing the limits. We gotta keep pressing in prayer. We gotta keep pressing and fasting. Tuesday night should not be the only night that you come in and get a breakthrough. That day is over with. If you don't have the time set aside every day that you go home, that your family, that you have time set aside to pray, to read the word of God, then that has to change. Because what happens when somebody calls you out on the street and says, oh, you look like you come over here from First Apostolic Church. Can you pray for me? Because we heard about what y'all could do. We heard about people getting healed of cancer. We heard about... Amen. Can you hear me? The reason why I brought this up is in Joshua 3 and 5, it talks about... Joshua tells him, he says, I need to get ready to sanctify myself. He said, because tomorrow, God is going to do a mighty work. That's what he said in Joshua 3, here's the fifth verse. Mm. So y'all get ready. He said, go sacrifice yourself because God get ready to do something awesome. And I'm telling us, this first episode church, sanctify yourself. Because God's about to do something awesome. Amen. One of the things that I found out is we talk about church a lot. The reason why people don't like coming to church, we got to be honest, we got to be able to evaluate and assess these things, is why people don't come to church is because they feel as if the church has no more value. People go to work, they can be sick, they can be near death, they'll go to a party, they'll go to the mall. But when church comes around, or when it's time for prayer, I'm too sick. Yeah. I'm too tired. Mm -hmm. I worked enough today. But we go to our jobs. Why? Because we understand that if you don't work, you ain't gonna pay no well bills. Can't pay bills. Can't move. That, that has purpose, so we can, we can do that without a shot. Like I said, we can be sick. I remember going to work, I threw them all over the place. I still went to work. But I made sure I was in the house of God. The church has to become more. In our lifestyle of consecration, because the Bible says that we cannot well, forsake the assembly of ourselves. We can't forsake that. We come in here. We, get, we come here to get built up, to be empowered, so that we can be sent out to do what we're called to do, whether that be evangelize, teach, do missions, whatever it is. Whatever it is that you've been called and purpose to do in your life. This is a place where you come, that you get, you get in, in, introduced to it, you start learning how to work your craft, you master it, and then you're released to do what God has called you to do. But when we lose sight of the purpose of the church, of consecration. We are not fed. And if we do have this very minimum, the church in the book of Acts is able to save thousands in one church meeting. And I know we say that's that's exaggerating, that's you know, that's too much, but I I, I believe in, in my own mind, I, I dream of taking over a stadium because we can't fit people in a church. But even that is hard for us to conceive because we don't understand our purpose anymore. We're here to save the lost. We've been saved. We got to go out and tell somebody else about who this wonderful Jesus is to inspire.
expose him. But we can't do that if we're not living consecrated lives. If our lives are not solely for the purpose of him to use it. We're going to stand up, Sister Katie, because I think I'm going to run over time this ain't very well. Um, but we got to come back to where the purpose is being established. Because when we have a purpose, I found out that you won't lose sight. When you understand that you're needed or you have a need for that thing, you'll do whatever it takes to get what it is. When I had first started my job in Elkhart, I didn't have a car. But you best believe that I found some way and somehow to get there every day until God bless in the car. If we could just do that with the anointings that God has put on our life. I don't know how I'm going to get there. I don't know how you work this thing. But I'm going to keep doing it until it show up. I'm going to keep preaching it until it show up. I'm going to keep living it until it manifests. If we could get that type of attitude and that mentality to be birthed back into the church of the firstborn, we're going to see stuff that not even our mind can comprehend. Stand. I'm telling you that God well, forgive me if this is seeming harsh, but God has been knocking. I mean, I've been reading uh, for the last couple of weeks, and God has just been revealing it to me about places. He said, well, one day you're just gonna have to come up. And it hurt to hear that. Because so so much so many times we feel the saints that we have perfected our walk with Christ, but then Jesus will come and say, Oh no, 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 no. No, I need you to change this. Your attitude about this is messed up, Alante. You can't. You can't think like that. Trying to, no, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. And it hurt. I cried and I said, God, I didn't even mean, I didn't even mean, it, mean to be it that way. I, I really thought I was your dog. No, 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 you're going to change. And if we can't take that word that God is trying to give us, it'll be like that, 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 that uh, parable where the sower comes and he tries to put in the seed and it don't come because the word gets choked out. It'll never manifest. God opened me up. So not only the blessings can come, but God, that I can be reproved. So that I can be agile in the spirit. I can be wise in the spirit. I can deserve in the spirit. I'm not tossed to and fro by everyone in the doctrine, but I am made steadfast and immovable in the faith of the apostles. We can't be afraid of the life of consecration. Because once again, it's directly attached to what God has invested into you. What God says that only you can do. And every time I get up here, I tell you that you have a purpose. You're not just called to sit on this pew and not do anything. You, you have a purpose. You have a gift of the Spirit. You may not have all 10 or 7 or 9 or whatever it is, but you got one. Find it in your place of consecration so that God can use you. If there are anyone that want to come to the altar, you can. I'm going to have a couple minutes of prayer. The children are not down yet. I pray that you receive the message. Hopefully, and the heart that it was supposed to minister in. We believe in grace. And you, if you've messed up, if you've fallen off, you're not exempt. You're not forgotten. You're not tossed away. The Bible says that it's not the race is not given to the swift or the strong, but it is given to what? He that what? Endures, right? So you might mess up.
So God, right now, release a fresh anointing on us. Empower us, God, so that when we leave out of here, that we don't go back. That we're not looking for moments of deliverance, moments of peace, moments of joy. But God, is it consistent in our life? That we don't go out and experience moments of prayer, but it's consistent in our life. That we don't go and move in moments of passion, but it's consistent in our life. God, let us have some consistency. Put it in our heart. Like David said, God, hide that word in our heart that we may not sin against it. Let that word be a lamp unto our feet, that we may not fall off the path of righteousness. And that where we are short, God, that you will build us up. That you would strengthen us in our mindsets, in our emotions, in our feelings, in our thought life. And God, we'll give you all the praise. Our life will praise you. Our life will worship you.